Plutonium-239? That one? That one? So, Plutonium-239 can be produced. So that tells us that the Plutonium is on yeah. this side. The Plutonium is PU, right? And it's 239, and the atomic number is 92, if I remember correctly. Produced by bombarding uranium 238. So we're taking uranium 238, and its number is. That's 92. That's 92. Question. Thank you. And we're bombarding it with alpha particles. Okay, so it says, how many neutrons will be produced as a byproduct of each reaction? What's the symbol for the neutron? Zero and one? Or one zero, sorry. Weight goes on the bottom. Or weight goes, damn it, that's the neutron. I think it weighs yeah. the It looks like bottom. ion. <laughs> one zero. No, other one. One oh. oh there okay. you go. Yeah. I see what you're saying. It looks zero. like okay. ion. I was already going to second guess myself. Okay. So. Add up the sides. We've got 238 plus 4 is how much? Uh, 242. Okay, and then 92 and 2 is? 94. So over here, I've got already 94, so I don't have to worry about that. I've got 239. So how many of these do I need? 230. Oh, so whatever you subtract from over there to get. Uh, okay, I see where you have 242, so you got to subtract 3 from 242 to get 239. You just put the 3 over there. Thanks. Well, I needed 3 more. I didn't need any more on the bottom, any more weight on the bottom, right? But I needed to add 3 to this to make it equal this side. The two sides have to equal. And you knew it was a neutron, so you knew what the symbol was. Yes? Can I write it? this way and if so originally I had the three there instead of there is, would that have been all right too or the three right there no that because that would not be the symbol for the neutron okay okay so you gotta have the three there and that's okay that's just not standard convention but that's okay, okay. but do you see That just means they're on the reactant side. So everything's on the mm -hmm. Okay. Alright, so when bombarded with neutrons, lithium six. So we've got lithium six. And lithium's atomic number is and it's bombarded with neutrons. It produces an alpha particle. and an isotope of hydrogen. So what's the atomic number for hydrogen? One. So that's gonna go on the bottom. Mm -hmm. What's the atomic number, I mean, what's the weight of hydrogen? Same one. one. All right, so then we just have to figure out how many of them there's we got. So six and one is seven, Two. and three and zero is I've already got three over here. Oh, hydrogen has it's going to be two there, right? So number three. All right, so now I've got seven on top, and on the bottom, I should only have.
tub, but it's an isotope. So it doesn't have a neutral. It's not regular hydrogen, which is one and one. It's an isotope, so we can have no neutrons, because all it can have is one, so the only way it could be an isotope is by having none. No weight. Since there's no neutron now, can I put the three on the top? No. How do I put the three? I thought that the one the one was dry because <coughs> you wouldn't multiply the bottom number by the three, right? Yeah, you would. You do? Mm -hmm. So now we've got two and three is five, which is not matching up over here. In this case, because it is an isotope, you can. Okay. It's not a coefficient. If it's a coefficient, that makes a difference than running it this way. So, if it's an isotope, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And if there is no neutron, is that right? Or no. does that affect Just if that? it's an isotope. Just if it's and an isotope. And you can say it's an isotope because it's got a different number of neutrons. Okay. This was how many of these neutrons the difference. How many of these neutrons versus what is the isotope? Yeah. This is like saying this is X and then how many of these X's do I have? In algebra, to put it to algebra. So when it says bombarded with neutrons, how do you know how many neutrons? You would assume it's just one because it says a number. It would have to tell you. Oh, okay. Because I mean, otherwise you've got no way of figuring it. You would have two unknowns, in okay. and you can't figure it out if you have two unknowns. Okay. All right. And then the last one it is neutron bombardment. So what are we doing? We're taking plutonium 239, and we said plutonium is 94. And we're bombarding it with neutrons, which is 1, 0, N, yields americium 240. And what's the atomic number for americium? 95? Correct. And another particle. Okay, so let's figure out that particle. We've got 239 and 1 is 240, so we know we're not going to have anything on top of whatever this is. 94 and 0 is 94. What do I have to do here to get this to be equal 94? Negative 1. What kind of particle is that? Or a beta particle. That's a beta emission. Okay, I'm, I'm finally starting to get it. Because I just I just thought it was an I need to be at birth. That's what I thought it was. Because that's what it looks like. Okay. But then when you broke it out and said it's a zero and a one, I understood it now. Okay. And that, that tells you what the particle is, the, the number and the charge. Kind of sort of the charge. And if this had been a plus one for whatever reason, then that would have been positron. Yeah. Well, in lab today, we will be watching the movie, okay. and then I'll have some questions for you to answer. Sorry. <laughs> you try to 
to start your heart? I do every time I got to eat. All right, so write the nuclear equation for the alpha decay, which means it's giving off an alpha particle. So, um, 31, 91. <coughs> so if I'm giving off an alpha particle, So 231 minus 4 is 227. And then 91 minus 2 is 89. What element is 89? 8. What? 8? 8. Uh, AC? AC. AC. Oh. I was going to say there is no A. Sorry. It's okay. So you see how this is working? Let's see how the head, because you were here yesterday, right? says decay, that means it's going to be given that off. Except it's a different symbol. So if we've got FR at CM223 87, and it's going to do beta decay, so 0, negative 1, E. That's my other particle. It's going to be 223 on the top and 88 on the bottom. And what is element 88? Radium. Hmm? Radium. Radium, so that's R-D? Radium. Radium. Sure, guys. You know, I told you I had a Geiger counter, but when you order the Geiger counter, they don't tell you any of the accessories you need, which normally they do on the Fisher website. So I called the guy yesterday. I'm like, you know, I got this Geiger counter and I got this isotope generator, but I got no probe. What do you mean? I got no probe. Don't Good. I have a probe? I don't know. So he goes on the website. Well, it doesn't say anything about a probe. I said, yeah, but. Does it work then? Oh. Let me call a minute. Yeah, you need a probe. Would you like to send me one? All right. And the probes, of course, are the Geiger counter was six hundred and sixty dollars. The probes are another four hundred dollars. Yeah. Hopefully, we should get that in before the end of the semester. Okay. Write a nuclear equation for the alpha decay of samarium. So it's going to be just like this one. And then the next one, number four, is going to be just like this one. Five and six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right? Do I need to do the rest of this? How are we doing? And how about the front page? Are you guys okay with that? nitrogen, the way we read this is we're bombarding nitrogen with alpha particles to produce something and a proton. 
Remember I said yesterday protons could be with a P or with an H. So we've got 18 on one side, so I'm going to need minus 1, so I've got 17 here. 2 and 7 is 9, minus 1 is 8, and what oxygen? Oxygen is only 8, right? Mm -hmm. right? Yes. So we have the proton, yeah, for the minus for one. Because the two sides have to have to be the same. So when I add 4 and 14, I've got 18 over here, and 2 and 7 is 9. So I've got to have whatever totals up to 18 and 9 over here. And I've already got 1s. So yeah, you just basically subtract to find what's missing. Not as bad as it looks. And you do them all that way. I'm just going to get the two sides to balance. I'm just getting confused on which element goes on which side. You, it'll say decay or emission. That means it goes on the, react, the product side. <laughs> because when you emit something, you're producing it. And when it's decaying, it's breaking down and producing. I'm trying to think if there's other words. And then <clears throat> for on the reactant side, you'll see bombarded. Most of the time, that's what is it just says bombarded. Like right. this one says the alpha decay of. So it's decay. And it went on. Yeah, it goes on this side. It went over here. Well, you put it on this side, like on number one on the nuclear equations worksheet, you put it on the le left side. Okay. On all those. Is Confusing me because it says okay. decay of. What happens when things decay? They break, down. they break down. So it produces. When something decays, it produces carbon and oxygen and nasty smell. And so bombardment would be over here. Decay or emit or emission means it goes over there. On the gamma radiation ones on the front page, mm -hmm. did I need to put an asterisk or a M or something or any? Was it M or was it? You can't. You don't have to. Okay. Because I mean, you know, it's gamma emission and it's not going to change. So I mean, like you might see, have seen that written this way, or you might have seen it written this way on the reactant side or either one of those three is fine especially when you know it's gamma de decay because it's just not going to transmute into anything else transmute okay now on number the second to the bottom where we had potassium. You notice I put gamma in there. But that was just to remember gamma usually goes with alpha or beta. And we've got beta decay going on there. So I just stuck a gamma in there just to show you that it can be written that way, but normally we treat them separately. Actually, when you have beta, you add. So you, it's just going up to the next element? Mm -hmm. So if I've got, let's do let's do number 10 on the nuclear equations worksheet. So it says write the nuclear equation from beta to k. So the beta particle is going to go over there. 
So you've got cesium-120, and it's going to go through beta decay. And that's a beta particle. So 120 and 0 is still going to be 120. 55 and negative 1. Well, but we need this side to equal 55. So what do I need here? 56. 56 minus 1 to equal 55. So it has to be equal on both sides. Yes, absolutely. And so what element is element 56? Uh, barium. What? Barium. Barium. or helium, you barium. Yep. 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 You missed my jokes, didn't you? I did. But the key is just to make sure the two sides equal. If you've got beta emission, you're going to go up an element. If you've got positron, you go down an element. So we could have the same thing if it said positron decay. Then we'd have this. So over here we have... You see the difference? Xenon. What if it were electron capture? reached out, pulled in an electron to transmit. So then over here, it's going to be 120 and 54. Good choice. And normally when you see beta, it's going to be emission. We won't usually see something's been bombarded by beta particles. That would actually be electron capture. Okay. Yes. Number nine. Write a nuclear equation with the with a beta. You just do it. Was that a variation of the one you did before? Or yeah, that I was just showing. This is the one that's on the problem okay. on the worksheet. I was just showing you what it would look like okay. in. Two of the different ways, either positron and electron capture. So, how would you know if we had a worm problem that dealt with positron? Would you put it say positron? Yeah, we'd say positron decay. Okay. Or underwent decay to produce a positron. Okay. You could also be you could be bombarded by positrons. Decay and bombardment is yeah, on the pretty much no bombardment's on this side. Bombard Bom bombardment is under reactants. Because I mean think about it, you're adding it to it. What's the other one that's on products? Product is decay or emission. Emission. Is there two for the reactant side as well, or? Other than the added to, I mean, there's no special word that I can think of that I've seen. So on the, this page, everything on here 
is going to go on the reactive side. Um, yesterday we talked about half-life, so if I asked you to calculate, if I started off with, oh, I don't know, what shall we start off with today? There's some isotopes yeah. Again, the isotopes are listed on page... I have made this amazing discovery. And I've got carbon 14 I've got a carbon 14 dated this amazing discovery. And it has I dated at eleven thousand four hundred and sixty years. How many half lives? Not necessarily question. So I've got this, let's say I'm going to try all that. And I'm dating it. Do it? 11,560, did I say? 460 years. I know that. Because I know that it's gone through, it's got half the carbon-14 it should have. And so they know, I mean, what they do is they, they since it's got half that it should have, they know it's gone through two half-lives. And that's how they date the age, because or know the age, because carbon-14 has a half-life of, what is it, 5,730 years? So from carbon-14, I have a half-life of 5,740 years. If I get this sample, and I know about how much it should have, because things at this certain age should have this much carbon-14, it's got half what it should, then that means it's gone through one half life. 30 years. Hmm? 30? Mm -hmm. Sorry. If it's gone through one half life, then the amount that I'm now measuring would be doubled if I'm going back the other way. Meaning, all right, so say I've got I've measured this trial bite and it's got 20 grams of carbon-14. If it should have 40, then that means it's gone through one half life. Every half life, so every 5,760 years, 30 years, it gets cut in half. So after a second half-life, how much should it have? There's your first half-life. It goes through another one. We're going the other way now. 
So you're cutting 5,730 in half, correct? No, I'm cutting this in half, the amount in half. Well, then that would be 10, correct? Mm -hmm. After a second half life, it's going to be 10. After another 5,730 years. It's going to be after another 5,730 years. It's going to be five. And then after another 7,000, it's like 5,730 years. Okay. That's really all half life, and I'm amazed I've got through this without saying shelf life. This is, this is how half lives work. It's just basically in this amount of time, it's going to be cut in half. And we know. If you look, we know carbon's got 5,730 years. Potassium is 1.6 times 10 to the ninth, or 1.3 times 10 to the ninth. Radium, 1,600 years. Most of these things have pretty long shelf lives. Shelf lives, you know, that's what you get. Half lives. It's a little scary when you think about nuclear energy. She goes back on her soapbox again. I think I talked about fission and fusion a little bit yesterday. There'll be more about that in the movie today. Fission, as it says, is where they take two nuclei and put them together. Now, just recently, the, the Higgs, Higgsman bows, it's called, where they did the, co the particle collider. That's what they're doing at CERN. And they did it the facility in Switzerland was built. It's like, and I told you yesterday, it's like the size of three football fields, and it's a mile underground. And they had to do this because part of the problem with doing fusion is that it generates a lot of energy, but it also generates a lot of heat or has to be done under a lot of heat. So they have this plasma ring that's, like I said, about three football fields in length. And they put the two particles in there, and they start spinning around, going faster and faster and faster under it's like a million degrees until they collide. Now, back to scientists don't necessarily always know what they have. Two years ago when they did this, the day they were doing it, there was all sorts of speculation about we're going to create a giant black hole and it's going to suck us into the black hole and we won't exist anymore. Did you guys remember hearing about that at all? I mean, people were really upset that these guys were doing this. Even scientists were upset because some scientists really thought we were going to turn into a giant black hole. Well, they did it. We didn't develop into a black hole, but the cooling system went down inside the, the reactor. Well, not, it's not the reactor, but inside the facility to do the plasma ring and blah, blah, blah. So, they weren't able to do it again, and they had to wait till winter time. They had to get it fixed, and then wait again the next year until winter time. And something happened last year where they couldn't do it, but then this year they did it, and that's the Higgsman Higgman bows, or also known as the God particle. And do you know what they did with it? Because you were talking about it yesterday. I haven't really had a whole. The particle. Yeah, I mean, because it, it didn't last very long, right? Well, they didn't have the particle. They just had the video and everything on the screen so they're just able to see it that it does exist they're actually mm -hmm. able to prove that it does exist mm -hmm. and um what's his name uh guy in the wheelchair oh um, Hawkins. yeah Hawkins. Stephen Hawking yeah he lost like ten dollars in a bet because he said it never be found and a lot of these I mean that's the case so we're talking about we've just seen an energy signal, and that's a lot of the case with these newer synthesized radioactive isotopes. We don't really have them, but we know they exist because we've seen the energy from them. Right? And like yesterday I was saying, if we ever get to the point where we can do it, it would be a big solution to our energy problem. And I don't know if you guys were listening to the news today, they're talking about now our our need in the U.S. for oil has gotten to be so bad that they're going deep, sh deep shale mining in Canada 
and talking about bringing a pipeline down from Canada. Now they've already had a line in Canada rupture a couple of times and cause environmental disasters that we just haven't heard about down here. So I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. But if we can ever get, and I'm inspiring you all to go out and look at cold fusion. We can never get those particles to collide under temperatures and speeds that aren't ridiculous. You'll be a billionaire. A billionaire. You'll be able to retire. <laughs> right. Now, what we're going to be looking at today in the movie is the splitting of the atom. But they actually had to do two reactions to get the bomb to go. They had to make an implosion in order to create an explosion. And what we're actually talking about, everybody should be familiar with this. Good old Uncle Albert came up with the energy of something, the energy something can release, is equal to its mass times the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared. So if you think about what that says, what that equation is saying, you don't really have to have a lot of mass to produce a buttload of energy because this is a big ass number. Square that number is going to be 9 times 10 to the 16th. So, in the atomic bomb, we were able to do a small, I mean, I think you're going to be really surprised at the size of the bomb. It really wasn't that big, or any bigger than our conventional bombs now. But the destruction it did was amazing. Like I said, people at the drop zone were instantly vaporized. We know they were there because we see their inverse shadows on walls. The light in the, the prototype that they dropped in Los Alamos, one of the things they got so excited about, General, General Graves, who was the guy that was really pushing the development of the bomb and then pushing the Manhattan Project, got excited because a girl born blind or blind from birth saw the light from the prototype that was dropped in New Mexico she saw it in Texas. That's, that's bright. That's bright. That's, that's not good. And they didn't know when they dropped it. I mean, you'll, Oppenheimer, you'll see that there, there'll be a scene where Oppenheimer, does everybody know Oppenheimer's considered the father of the atomic bomb? Right. Um, where he's sitting around the table with all the government officials, and he's like, ah, we'll probably see a bright light for a couple hundred feet, or maybe, you know, maybe a couple miles, and there'll be this amount of noise, and there'll be this and that and this. Huh. And like I said, when they, after they dropped the prototype, a lot of the scientists were starting to go, uh-uh, we don't need to do this. We don't need to, uh, don't, don't, don't drop this thing. But General Groves had his hands on it. And by God, he was going to drop it whether we needed to or not. Like I said the other day, Japan had already retired. Hitler was already gone. There was no need to drop the first bomb. There was definitely no need to drop the second bomb. And we did drop two. So the destruction that those did and the impact of that is still being felt today. You're still seeing children in the areas. Now the areas are habit habitable as opposed to what happened at Chernobyl. But you're still seeing children born with high levels of thyroid cancer, high levels of birth defects. And this is, what, 60 some odd years later, 70 some odd years later? Okay. Um, what we're doing is we're taking an atom. And like the, the hydrogen bomb, I believe, was we took helium and split it. It's easier to split an atom, apparently, than it is to put two together. So split it. And 
I'm not real sure exactly how the mechanism works with it imploding and then exploding, but they had to do carved mirrors and put it inside the bomb in order to get the implosion to go and then the explosion. So fission is fusing two atoms. Vision is splitting the atom. It is the basis of most of our nuclear energy and the bombs that we've got now and the nuclear weapons that we have. I've had soldiers tell me that they've dealt with guns or some kind of... Somebody was talking about how they take repleted uranium. So uranium has been used for power plants and stuff. Then they're taking it and repleting it, bringing it back around and using it in just standard weapons. Is anybody military? Former military? <laughs> like the golf, like the rail guns before they shoot like actually energy burgers. Proto uh, photons. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yes. But it is a really? conventional yeah. weapon that we could use if we needed to, right? Yeah, yeah I think no. that's what the guy was talking about. So, and then fusion is joining two atoms, or however many atoms. Okay. That's really all we're going to need to know about this chapter. I'm going to let you guys escape for a while. Um, I would say bring popcorn, but we can't have any popcorn.